This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. Look like there's any dogs over there. Oh well, they're doing something else. <clears throat> so, hey, what's going on, everybody? Just did a show earlier today on the Jody Arias case, and uh, might be some noise in the background, but you know, there's people doing things <laughs> around. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, the Jody Arias one was pretty funny at the end because Alice Violet said, "Are you, are you angry with me?" <laughs> to uh, Juan Martinez, and the whole the, like about thirty people started laughing in there. But anyways, uh, I don't know. This is Memorial Day weekend, uh, I guess. But tomorrow is actually Memorial Day, and you know. Hopefully people did their celebrating or whatever they're doing. You know, it's like the 4th of July to some people or whatever uh, today. Uh, but tomorrow is sort of more of a, a somber day where you kind of reflect on all the sacrifices that the military, our, our military members of society have made for all the rest of us so that we can live in a free society continuously. Right, so they've made, I mean, think of all the pain that so many families have felt and actually pain that soldiers have felt themselves in defending this country. Right, so there you go, that's what tomorrow is about. Not like, hey everybody, I hope you had a great uh, Memorial Day, right? Uh, it has nothing to do with that. So anyways, uh, that that's, more for tomorrow. Today is Sunday. Uh, just a regular day it happens to be the weekend of the of Mem Memorial Day, which is tomorrow. So, all right. Anyways, we're going to be doing a you know, a live stream right now. We I have a smaller goal up there. Hopefully, we can try to reach that. And I'm going to try to do a show like in two hours and you know, tw ten minutes or so. So, now it's kind of interesting, this last one, Emily Flotilla sent it to me, and I used three different newspaper archives. One of them's right there in the town that I just found right at the last second there, so I have a couple more. And also, Scout and Dude, if you, if you can send me, I mean, we do Wounded Warriors, but is there some fund or something out there for perhaps like uh, identifying Chewbacca? soldiers or something, you know, that'd be pretty cool to donate to something like that. So if you can find one, send me an email to, you know, you don't have to keep everybody. Just start typing them in chat because they're all everybody's know, you know, everybody knows everything. So scouting dude, if you could send me the uh, like a something related to Memorial Day where you're. You know, maybe they're out there still trying to identify soldiers that are not identified. That'd be pretty amazing to have a like a repository of individuals who aren't identified and then actually be part of identifying them through identifinders or something like that for those families. I'm not sure if there's something like that exists. But uh, send me an email, Scott and Dude, let me know. Right. Thank you, Danielle. And traveling Teresa. 
I mean, Wounded Warriors is always good anyway, so I mean, if, if you don't think of a better one, we'll do that one tomorrow. Okay? And then the end of the month is actually the 31st, but, you know, why not tomorrow, right? <laughs> so thank you. All right, let me get moving on to something else. So, uh, it was Emily Flotilla sent me this, I don't know, maybe on the 24th. I didn't see the email till today, but thought I would look it up. I uh, didn't really get to read much about it, but we have the some newspaper articles from back then, 1977, July 27, Deborah Lynn Polinski in Holland, Michigan. It's another one of those cold cases. Well, I mean, people can just send in an email with a, a, a case. It's not like it's, you know, don't uh, over, you know. All right, so here is the one of the articles right here where it says, a woman's nude body found at her home. This is in, let's see, this might not even be in, well, South Bend, I don't know if there's a South Bend, Michigan, too. But this might be in Indiana, where there just is an AP story here. But it says, police are investigating the death of a 20-year-old Ottawa County woman whose nude body was discovered at her home after she'd been missing from work for two days. Ottawa County Sheriff's deputies identified the victim as Deborah Polinski. One of Ms. Polinski's fellow workers contacted police after the woman failed to show up for work. Monday uh, and Tuesday. Deputies who discovered the body said the woman had uh, apparent head injuries and other wounds. The weapon used in the killing was not found. One person was questioned in the slang, deputies said, but was released and no charges were filed. What is this? One person was questioned in the slang, deputies said, but okay. And they didn't find the weapon. Thanks, Dobby Smith. One person was questioned in the slang, deputy said, but was released and no charges were filed. Well, by the way, I, I do want to say this. So it has nothing to do with it. Miss Polinsky lived in rural Port Sheldon oh, Township, east of here. Okay. Bless America, USA. That's right. There's no U at the end there, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> what was it? <laughs> you know, this is, this is what was funny. See, there at the end of the... The uh, trial that we're watching today, the Jody Arias trial today, Zozo came in and said, her hair was slicked back so far, she buttered her toast with her leg hair. <laughs> and I, you know, and the funny part is I was like, I'm trying hard to picture that. And then I was driving to uh, the, I had to get some wood screws for something outside and uh, I just started laughing like I literally just started laughing and laughing and laughing because I real uh, then I pictured it like her hair was slicked back like it goes so far down that the grease from it go <laughs> is on like the back of your legs and you start buttering toast I mean it's just <laughs> I don't even know where that maybe that's a phrase over there I, I don't know I don't know where it came from but it was pretty funny uh, anyways, uh, so here, here are some, I just found these at the last minute here because there was an article somewhere and I could make out the bottom of the H-O-L-L -L and I, I go, oh, I've seen Holland Sentinel. I looked it up. It's on the third news repository that I, I got. So this is uh, this is it right here, and here that's the actual house here. And amazingly, uh, I found in another article the address, and it actually shows right now in this one. So, fifteen one two three New Holland Drive, right? But you go down to New Holland Drive and you look at it and you go, oh, uh, does that look like this? And the answer is no, it doesn't look like that. See that right there? It it doesn't look like that at all. See that? I'll wait for people to, right there, right? Uh, 
So that doesn't look like it. And so I, I realized, just finally realized, I don't know why it's taking me so long, but right at the top here in Google Earth is Google Maps of the same location. So you just click on that, then it opens up the same spot. You go down here and you click in to the street view here and you look there and by God, that's not it. But when you go to see more here, go back to like 2011, or that one doesn't work because there's a bus there, but you can see the house back there. And this one, so there it is. That house was there and that's this one right here, see? It's just not there now. Somebody destroyed it and built a new one. So it was just right off the road here. You get a better feel for what was going on. Okay, so now uh, instead of having the newer street view, which would be this one where it's a completely different house, uh, you get to see what it actually looked like, like that. I wonder if you can, that, the same trees and everything over there. Yeah, look at that. Look how crazy that is. See that tree with the double like that? Boom. That's right here. So everything's still there. Or was there until probably like 2015 or whatever. Alright, this article here is from July 27th, 1977. July 23rd is when she was last seen by somebody. Numerous puncture wounds in the chest was listed as the cause of death of Deborah Lynn Polinsky, 20, the victim of an apparent sex slaying whose body was found early Tuesday afternoon in her rented home in a rural area southeast of here. The nude body of Polinsky, 15123 New Holland Drive, who worked at uh, Dupree Chemical at 130 Central Avenue, was discovered by a co-worker at 12.04 p.m. who went to her home after she did not show up for work Monday or Tuesday. She could have been dead since Sunday, deputy said. Uh, no one was being held in the case. An acquaintance of Polinsky, questioned in the slang, was released early Tuesday evening by the Ottawa County Sheriff's Department. The body was found on a bed in the one-story wooden frame home, according to Ottawa County Sheriff Detective Lee Posma. She appeared to have been sexually assaulted before being slain, Deputy said. Miss Polinsky had been stabbed with a, so she was, looks like she was sexually assaulted. Uh, Miss Polinsky had been stabbed with a sharp object approximately five times, mostly in the chest. According to Ottawa County Sheriff Bernard Grison, a stab wound in the upper chest area caused the death, he said. There also were numerous superficial stab wounds elsewhere on the body. No murder weapon was found near the body, although sheriff detectives uh, took into evidence some sharp object found in the house. There were some signs of a struggle on the bedroom area, or in the bedroom area. There were some signs of it, but they found no murder weapon. There were some signs of a struggle in the bedroom area, according to Grayson, or Grayson. Uh, there were bruise marks found on the body the bruise marks on the body would indicate some beating but there were not they were not extensive the sheriff said she could have been beaten before the time of her death he added well that's what i would think because then it wouldn't bruise after that you would get to get the lividity type stuff that looks like bruising Grison ruled out robbery as a motive in the case although detectives are looking for any items that may be missing from the home. We have obtained evidence uh, at the scene you, uh, that you would call beneficial. Whether they could lead to a suspect is questionable, but we're glad to have it, Grison said. She could have died within 48 hours pri uh, period prior to when the body was found, according to a preliminary autopsy report. Ms. Polinsky was last seen Saturday by friends and relatives. Bosma said she had been living alone in the home for approximately a year. And that's her right there. There's no one living... Uh, let's see. There's no one living for several blocks in the area. 
A fingerprint expert from Oakland County, Nelson Jalinas, is assisting in the case because he's an expert in a new body fingerprinting method, according to Pozma. Polinski's slaying was the second homicide in Ottawa County this year. On January 8th, Douglas Lee Shopfock died from multiple stab wounds in his home in Coopersville. Hmm. Keith Holman, 24, was on trial, and okay, so that one's been solved. Surviving are his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Roger Bukema and Holland of Holland, and oh, that's weird. So, what, where is this? <laughs> oh, I mean, of Holland, not the, the country. I was like, whoa. Uh, funeral services will be held Friday at 2.30 p.m. And then there's another one in that same newspaper. This one's on August 2nd. Last one was July 27th. Let's turn right there. Detectives working on the homicide of the Deborah Polinsky of Deborah Polinsky are making a plea to the public for information that hopefully will lead to the killer of the 20-year-old. It has been one week since the body of the Holland native was found in her rented home in a rural area of Port Sheldon. Ottawa County Sheriff's detectives, joined by Holland City detectives, are conducting a, an extensive search into the homicide of Deborah Polinsky. We request that anyone having information on the incident to contact their local police office or the Holland Silent Observer Program, Ottawa County Sheriff Bernard Grayson. Uh, said. <laughs> Man, that was like the longest run-on sentence I think I've ever seen. The silent observer number is 3924443. Grison said the Holland police detectives are assisting in the case. Polinsky lived in, the Hol in Holland before moving to the rented home on New Holland Street near 152nd one year ago. Detectives are hoping someone will come forward with information that will lead to a suspect in the homicide of Polinsky. The nude body of the victim was found around noon, July 26, on a bed in the bedroom of the story and a half wood frame home by a friend of Polinsky's at Dupree Chemical in Holland. When the friend entered the home that day, lights and television set were on in the house. The door to the house was ajar, according to police. Thank you, Kathy Chapin. Yeah, so it's going to be a little shorter show to try to get to the goal, but if you can, if we can do it, we can do it. If we don't, we don't. Yeah, 77 is a long time ago. Detectives are hoping someone will come forward with information that will lead to a suspect in the homicide of Polinsky. The nude body of the victim was found around noon, July 26, on a bed in the bedroom of the, of the story and a half wood frame home by a friend of Polinsky's. When the friend entered the home that day, lights and a television set were on in the house. The door to the house was ajar, according to police. Police working in teams are showing a recent photo of Polinsky to persons who may have seen her after she was last seen at 9 p.m. July 23rd. The enlarged photo of Deborah was taken with her family, let's see, with her family approximately a week before the homicide. The picture used in previous news accounts was taken when Polinsky was in ninth grade, so yeah, that, this one's m way more accurate here. Polinsky died from stab wounds to the chest from an unknown sharp object, according to a pathologist report. The report also stated the victim was not sexually assaulted before being slain. Nah, I, I, I doubt that. They said that she was. They took it back so that they, they didn't want that somebody to know that. The investigator working on the case said they are talking to many people who knew Polinsky. He said Polinsky, although described as someone who kept to herself, still knew many people. Bryson also announced no further new news items on the murder will be released until deemed necessary. So that's from the Newspaper Archives website, and this one is from 
newspapers.com, August 3rd. A young woman was found dead by a friend who went to check on her. A spokesman said Miss Polinsky was believed to have been living alone when slain. There's that one. Then we've got another one. <coughs> another one on a different newspaper archive. Genealogy Bank. That's not really big, but it says now there's a re reward offered on August 12th for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the killer of a 20-year-old woman. Police, meanwhile, reported no new leads in their investigation into the stabbing death of Deborah Polinsky, whose nude body was found by co-workers in her rented Port Sheldon Township home. Then, basically, it just disappeared out of the papers. And now we got 2017. Let's see what this one says. Six starts right now. And thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Derek Francis. And I'm Michelle DeSelms. And first at six, it has been 40 years since a young woman was found murdered inside her Ottawa County home. But tonight, police say they have some new leads. Yeah, and they are still asking for your help, finally cracking the cold case of Deb Polensky. Dana Chiklis joining us in studio after hearing from her family tonight. Dana? Well, the last four decades, tips have come in, but no arrests ever made. I don't know, Cindy. It seems like the day is pretty consistent throughout the day. It's different now at night. ...in the sexual assault and murder of 20-year-old Deb Polinsky. Earlier, we sat down with her younger sister, Tammy Elzinga, who says Deb was a free spirit. She kept to herself, and she loved her animals. Tonight, their family has hope that Deb will get justice. This kind of shows that she was a daughter, she was a sister, she was an aunt. Holding this photo, Tammy Elzinga remembers her older sister, Deb Polinsky, just 19 years old here with family at her last Christmas. She was uh, fiercely independent. She uh, liked to uh, do it her way and she was um, very strong willed and loved animals. She loved her pets. In July 1977, Polinsky was 20, living in this farmhouse on New Holland Street in Port Sheldon Township, along with her German Shepherd Thor and some other pets. She had a duck, Dudley, and she had a cat, but I don't remember the name, but yeah, she had a lot of animals. She liked animals. Dropping out of Holland High when she was 16 to go out on her own, Polinsky <laughs> later worked the line at Dupree That's Chemical duck, Company. Dudley. But one day, Deb didn't come to work. A friend who went to check on her found her stabbed to death on her bed. So this case re has remained open since that time. 40 years of police work and two detectives working the case full time the last 18 months led to a discovery. Retesting DNA evidence, they found another woman was present in Polinsky's home when she was killed. That Whoa. may, uh, you know, How do they know that? spur somebody's memory into coming forth uh, with some additional information. That's really all we need is that, wow. that key piece one. of the puzzle to put this thing together and to move forward with, with the, the case. Asking for any tips for justice for Polinsky. Well, I think now um, we have some hope. You know, there's been quite a few years where there's been no oh, hope. So it DNA, hasn't, you the... know, nobody's done anything and, you know, nothing's nothing new has come out. So. I think more than anything, I think all of us realize we have some hope now. You know, there's new leads coming out and they, you know, they are working strongly on the case. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a big thing. Just unimaginable mm -hmm. here. Wow. Many surviving members of the yeah. family. So the family of Deborah Lynn Polinsky alongside the Ottawa County Sheriff's Office are asking for tips from the public after the cold case team made a new discovery investigating the 1977 homicide. A co-worker, let's see, Deborah Lindblom, after 40 years of police work, investigators say retested DNA evidence proves another woman. So there must be blood. I mean, another woman could be at her house. It can't be a hair. Now, I guess if it's a hair stuck in blood, maybe something like that. But it could be that a friend was over at the house and the hair... You know, when she bled, the hair got in it. But, I mean, it seems more like likely that you'd have to find blood at the scene or, or, or there's like an object that was necessarily used there that had DNA on it that like, another person likely wouldn't touch. 
It's hard to say, but that's pretty interesting. A co-worker found Polinsky stabbed to death on July 26, 1977, after she did not show up for work the day before second shift at Dupree Chemical Company. Police believe Polinsky was sexually assaulted. So, see how it's in there now? Before she was murdered. I mean, that's weird. So, who did that then? Found naked on her bed and her rented at a renter uh, farmhouse on New Holland Street. Polinsky's younger sister, Tammy Elzinga, tells Fox 17 she and her family now have uh, some hope Polinsky will get justice. She held a photo of her sister Thursday. Polinsky was photographed at 19. This kind, I wish they would tell us how they know that. Polinska says Polinsky dropped out of Holland High School when she was 16 to go out on her own. At 20, in 1977, she says Polinsky lived at the farmhouse with her boyfriend's, with, at farmhouse with, she's got that boyfriend, with her beloved pets, including a cat, a duck named Dudley, and her German Shepherd. So they had pictures of the duck and the German Shepherd. She was fiercely independent. Yeah, we heard that. Uh, then it tells Fox 17, there's no known motive for Polinsky's death. The sheriff's office, uh, ah, God, I wonder. Man, it's so weird. If she was sexually assaulted, was there semen left there? Or is it sexually assaulted in another way by a female using like a, an object or something? And like this person was angry. I don't know, man. That's just kind of strange. Oh, you worked with her? Oh, cool. Okay, well, you sent it to me. You didn't say you worked with her. So what do you think's going on here then, Emily? I mean, what's this deal with this other woman at the scene? It's pretty weird. Chewbacca? Oh, I'll be Chewbacca if you want me to. Thanks, Gray. I worked with Deb. What do you mean it's very convoluted? <laughs> uh, they don't. There doesn't seem to be a lot of convoluted information. It's, there's almost. There's not a lot of information. Is what I'm saying. Well, you don't have to say sorry. She just worked with her. She didn't say they were best friends. Traveling, Teresa. Uh, let's see. Eighteen months in that time, Bennett says they've interviewed more than 180 people, sent 40 DNA samples to the lab for comparison, and analyzed more than 600. Well, this is a 2017 article. Uh, drug cartels? I don't know. It just uh, that sounds crazy. Polinsky was known to frequent Holland and Sogtuck and attend Holland public schools, he said. She was frequently seen in a red Volkswagen Beetle and was often around her German Shepherd Thor. With this new discovery, asking for any new information, why don't they do, well this is 2017, so they need to do genetic genealogy on that same DNA that they were, hey there was a female there, and just figure out who it is. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. Or maybe, maybe this is a good one for us to contact because that's a small little community there. How about you, Emily? Do you have any uh, contact over there? Why don't you say, hey, or you guys want to identify who that is? That's a perfect one for us. Yeah, I, I just don't buy the, the gang thing. It just, that's such an easy out. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, the gangs, the gangs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but why don't you find out that? Because if they haven't identified it, we can do it. I mean, they might not have the funds. $6,000 over there? Forget it. And speaking of that, you guys, uh, that's the only way we can get things done here is if you guys are supporting the channel on a nightly basis. So now we just have the goal at the top. You can see what the goal is. Let's see. Uh, we'll contact them on Tuesday. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's definitely something... Uh, I mean, I'd love to do something like that. <laughs> that would be amazing. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, yeah, make that contact, and we'll see what happens. Oh, 
There was one more from December of 2019. We'll take a look at that one. Was I done with the other one now? Pretty much. Polinsky was known to frequent these places. There's been quite a few years where there's been no hope. More than anything, I think all of us realize we have some hope now. There's new leads coming out. I don't even, I can't even tell what's going on in here. Hold on. <sighs> Out there. No. Nope. Oh, that was a basketball video. That was from like yesterday. I have all these video, these links open here. So it's throwing me off. Hold on. Okay, I gotta open up the control panel YouTube deal now. Okay, there we go. Oh, well, well no more. We only have 102 people watching. Because people are over at barbecue. So maybe we'll just hold off on the second half of this till tomorrow. No, that's why I brought up the part about maybe the woman's the one that sexually assaulted her with something because she was angry. All right, let's see. Okay, 40 years after the murder of Deborah Lynn Polinsky, the Ottawa County Sheriff's Office is making progress on solving Polinsky's cold case. Polinsky's body was found uh, by her co-workers after she failed to show up for work on July 26, 1977. She was last seen on July 23, 1977. Polinsky's body was found in her bedroom at a rented farmhouse in New Holland Street near 152nd Avenue. Polinsky, 20, at the time of her death, was found naked in her bedroom with stab wounds and blunt force trauma to her head. Hmm, so maybe somebody knocked her out first, then stabbed her. No weapon was found at the scene, and there is no known motive for her death. We took on the cold case about 18 months ago, and we began looking at this in more in-depth fashion, said Ottawa County Sheriff's Office Captain Mark Bennett. Our cold case team is exclusively working on this 1977 case. Nice. In an attempt to reach more members of the public who may have, been, have information about Polinsky's death, the Sheriff's Office has created a Facebook page called Justice for Deb Polinsky with uh, information about the murder and contact information for detectives looking at the case. Well, hey, maybe, I'll, maybe that's what I could do right there. After reopening the cold case, police believe female was at the scene at the time of the murder and are asking specifically for information about that person. Police have also submitted evidence from the scene for testing, including for uh, DNA samples and hundreds of fingerprints. So far, there has not been a positive identification of a sub suspect. We don't have a name attached to it yet, Bennett said. Hopefully, that's fruitful. Polinsky worked Second shift at the Pre Chemical Company and went to Holland Public Schools. She was known to frequent the Holland and Sagatuck areas after uh, often in her red Volkswagen Beetle. She was also known to be accompanied by her German Shepherd Thor. When Polinsky's body was found, Thor was standing nearby, Bennett said. So it's interesting. I mean, maybe it's somebody that knew her. Uh, if Polinsky was alive, she'd now be 60, while Bennett said time can sometimes be a benefit in investigating a case. Many of Polinsky's friends and family have moved around the country. 
Her parents, who still live in the area, are now in their 90s. You're kind of running against the clock, Bennett said. Hopefully we'll be able to answer some things for the family. I'd like to get some answers before they pass. We think we have some investigative leads. Hey, we, why don't you guys go out and share the show really quick? Like, I'm just going to pause it. And you guys hit, go out and hit the share button, all right? And go put it somewhere. That'd be great, thanks. Okay. Did I do the Twitter one? Yeah, I don't know if I doubled that one. Do Facebook. Okay, there we go. I think people are just like there's barbecues. Probably wasn't a good day to do the uh, do a evening show. To be honest with you. I was just trying to sneak it in, you know, but <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's going to be beneficial. Uh, but this case is, we'll get this one in and then I'll just kind of, we'll see where we're at. If Polinsky was alive, she'd now be 60. While Bennett said time can sometimes be a benefit in investigating a case, many of Polinsky's friends and family have moved around the country. Her parents, who still live in the area, are now in their 90s. You're kind of running against the clock, Bennett said. Hopefully we'll be able to answer some more things for the family. So this is 2017 before genetic genealogy. So, man, I'm, you'd hope that they, that was the first thing they did more recently is get that uh, female DNA identified, wouldn't you think? Makes sense to me. Thanks, Chera Doobie. So there's the German Shepherd on the floor. That's what it looked like in the house there. There was, we've seen other, all the other photos as well. Not sure why, the, how it were, why they're using this picture here. Pretty crazy though. I didn't say anything about fourth century. We read it. We read through it. Okay, cool. And we got two more people from that. Awesome. Ah, uh, maybe I'll just do it anyways. I, I guess I don't have anything to do for the next hour. But it'd be nice to save it because this next one's long and it'd be cool to have a bigger crowd. It's an old one. And those ones are, I think, are have a lot more interesting information in them. What do you guys think? Okay, do you know the detective, Emily? Like, do you talk to them? Or maybe I can... Ask, I don't know, what do you think? Well, I'll take the lack of an answer to be affirmative. So here, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'm going to save the other story, the McQuarrie and the other one for probably, I don't know. I'm not sure what to do to tomorrow. I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't, I mean, I might just have the lines open or something for people to call in or something like that. What do you think? That's what I'm saying. Oh, you're not at barbecue? <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Jessica Schubach and Travel and Teresa. Um, let's see. I'm not sure. You think it'd be cool tomorrow to have people like Scout and Dude and other people call in maybe and just talk about service or, or even wives and people that are, you know, I'm sure people in the chat have military family members and they could call in and say what it's like when they're overseas serving and things like that. Can we start a $2 wave? Ocean wave, ocean wave. Yeah, this one is interesting here. I'd love to help 
be part of help solving this one. You know, if they've got DNA in there, even if it's just a hint of who that lady was that was there. They didn't say that though, Zozo. We just read we just read it in the article. It said the exact opposite of that. I'm going to go by with what was in the article that the dog was standing nearby when they came in. Yeah, that makes more sense to me. Although I guess you could say when the friend came over. And maybe looked around, did they open the door for the dog, and then when the police got there, the dog was standing nearby now? Thanks, Annie, too. Yeah, send me the link to where somebody says that. Nothing worse than it's like, I mean, it happens all the time. I'm not saying it's bad, but like you guys always say, here's what somebody said on Facebook that says this. Hey, it says this over here, but I don't get the link to it. You know, I'd, I'd like to see the original, like where it came from. You know, that's what I need. Thanks, Linda Molden Howe of the Cattle Mutilations and Crop Circles. Well, no problem, Emily. What have you heard about the dog? Have you heard anything about like where the dog was since you were there? I mean, not at the scene. You're not the, the, wait a minute. Where were you, Emily? I mean, how close of a friend were you back then? Oh, I smell the barbecue. <laughs> Somebody's, no, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Here, maybe I'll go to that Facebook page that was in that article. As in the last one, one by the sheriff. There it is. I don't know. Let me make sure. Justice for Debbie Polinsky. Is that the name of this one? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so somebody just says that in here. Like, so here, here's, here's the thing is... Uh, uh, Zozo sent me the link for that one, but like if you, you you see this stuff. This is the justice for Polinsky and then right up here Somebody types in the dog was locked in another room So it, it is assumed that Deb was familiar with their attacker who, who, who said that I mean, this is just some random person typing in That and I it's just hard for me to just go sure. That's a fact in the case You get what I'm saying? I mean, it's cool that somebody said that and kind of makes sense, you know, that kind of a little bit like in the uh, Idaho 4 case. But how do you uh, just accept that comment that some random person made it? I don't know. I don't know how to do it. To me, it's like I just want to be, makes me more skeptical of it. Let's see what it says. Uh, thank you, everyone who has contacted me and sought out Beverly Shipper. She has been, I okay, guess, somebody else. Mr. Polinsky was our bus driver to away games. One day, I don't recall what triggered this. He kind of blurted out that uh, what had happened to his daughter. It really shook me up. February 16th, she'd be 61. Uh, 
the Deb pet Doc Dudley, Deb's family members had brought over items on Saturday prior to her death to help with the duck coop and we later had a really fine Peking duck. It, it was absolutely amazing. It, oh, it doesn't say that, everybody. Uh, so this is the one with the dog in it. The German Shepherd Thor, he was very protective. Uh, many believe the attacker would have known the dog. <laughs> Come on, Cindy. That's just as funny, man. Don't you remember my friend's joke? He said, I don't know why those people don't hunt in the park. <laughs> well, you've seen all the ducks that are going around. Uh, the dog was, yeah, see, it's just somebody saying the dog was locked in another room. However, in the article that we just read, I think it was this one. Ah, Jesus. Uh, Bennett said the dog was extremely protected over her, and police believe the suspect would have known Thor. Okay, so that makes sense in this one. Now, when Polinsky's body was found, Thor was standing nearby. See, that's different. So I think it's more likely that uh, the dog was just there, you know, and somehow it didn't seem to react to what was going on. I mean, it says right here that Thor was standing nearby. Now, could nearby be that it was in another room with the door shut? I guess, but I mean, wouldn't you, that's sort of important. You might mention that. Uh-huh. Yeah, so what? What, what? what difference does it make about the red Volkswagen? That's her, though, right? I mean, it's not the person in re in red. It says right here, uh, she was known to frequent the Holland and Sagatuck areas often in her red Volkswagen. Okay, that's her Volkswagen, the one, the murder victim. Well, I guess that's a, <laughs> I guess that could be it, Zozo. But that's not what the point that person was making. That you sent so we could all come up with all these things the dog was locked in another room see that right there in another room that means a different room than the body she was found in so boom <laughs> all right let's see yeah it was her car so i don't know what the enthusiasm with the red volkswagen is it's just that's her car you know so they were really asking did anybody see her after that day like for example i don't know i think it must have been what was it a friday or what day of the week was that here let me go open up the original one so it's the 23rd this is a um wednesday so then it'd be tuesday the 26th monday the 25th uh then the 24th would be sunday the 23rd is Saturday. So you've got Saturday is the last time anybody saw her. So what if she went somewhere and really didn't make it home and went to uh, some other place they're wondering? I just have a feeling she was at home and somebody killed her in there. I mean, why would she go somewhere else? And I mean, I guess she could have gone somewhere, brought some people home, like it was a party or something like maybe a guy and a girl and her and something went haywire and you know somebody killed him and so maybe it was later in the evening the dog was used to them already you know how after a while they you're there and things seem normal for the dog blue doesn't isn't like that he'll just keep barking and barking and barking and barking She was home and maybe uh, brought a friend or something. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, obviously she was killed at home. I mean, you think somebody killed her somewhere and brought her back? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we read those in articles that, about parties. <coughs> blue does? How would expect that? He seems... No, I mean, blue barks like if somebody's in the house that he doesn't know, he just keeps on kind of... Uh, uh, until you actually literally hand blue to the person. And then as soon as you put the dog, he puts them on the ground, he keeps doing it. But you know what? You want to hear something weird, though? Like when my uh, when my stepkids came over the for the first time, they never even. It's almost like they could tell that they that they were related to Chris. I mean, it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. They just run right up, jump in the lap, and everything. Just no no big deal. Yeah, well, it's interesting that nobody's come forward if she was out at another party somewhere. It seems like somebody would have said, hey, you know, sat quietly, hey, I saw her at this party. But it is a small town, so a lot of times people, uh, you know, they don't want to say anything because it's so small. Everybody knows who said what. Yeah, but they seem to be able to sense a scent that's familiar, like, it's crazy. <laughs> Somehow they could tell that they were related to Chris, yeah. Mm. It doesn't really say where she was last seen. That's one of the things that's not in there. She merely just didn't show up for work, and but it says that she was seen and at the 23rd, though, which is Saturday, so I doubt she was working that day. Here, let me, let's look at this one again. Numerous puncture wounds in the chest was listed as the cause of death of Deborah Lynn Polinsky, the victim of apparent sex slaying, whose body was found early Tuesday afternoon in her rented home in a rural area southeast of here. The nude body of Polinsky, 15123 uh, New Holland Drive, who worked at Dupree Chemical, 130 Central Avenue, was discovered by a co-worker at 12.04 p.m. who went to her home after she did not show up for work Monday or Tuesday. She could have been dead since Sunday, deputy said. Let's see. Show for when she could have been dead since Sunday, deputy said. No one was being held in the case. An acquaintance of Polinsky questioned in the slang was released early Tuesday evening by the Ottawa County Sheriff's Department. I wonder if that's a male. The body was found on a bed in the one story wooden frame home. And that post on Facebook says the dog was found in another room. According to Ottawa County Sheriff's Detective Lee Posma, she appeared to have been sexually assaulted before being slain. Remember that one article said she was not? So they were trying to change the narrative, but it was kind of too late. Ms. Polinsky had been stabbed with a sharp object approximately five times, mostly in the chest area, according to Ottawa County Sheriff Bernard Grison. The stab wound in the upper chest area caused the death. There also were numerous superficial stab wounds elsewhere on the body. So maybe sort of defensive wounds or hesitation or you know or just her dodging and no murder weapon was found near the body although sheriff detectives took into evidence some sharp objects found in the house. There were some signs of a struggle in the bedroom area, according to Grison. There were bruises, there were, there were bruise marks found on the body. The bruise marks on the body would indicate some beating, but uh, they were not extensive, the sheriff said. She could have been beaten before the time of her death, he added. Grison ruled out robbery as a motive in the case, although detectives are looking for any item uh, that may be missing from the home. Hey, Did thank you, you love oh, the I'll sun one hundred. Uh, 
Um, well, no, but they didn't find a knife at the scene. So, how would they know? She could have died within a 48 hour period to when the body was found. Hmm. So, they didn't find any food in her stomach or anything? That would have said. The nude body of the victim was found around noon, July 26, on a bed in the bedroom. So it was in the bedroom, and there was looked like there had been a, a struggle going on in the bedroom. Of the story and a half wood frame home by a friend of Polinsky. When the friend entered the home that day, lights and television set were on. So that could have been to, you know, either like she might have actually been watching TV and the attack happened, or to sort of, I mean, it's weird because there's nobody living near them. So the, the TV being on and stuff like that, there was, it wasn't necessary to hide the sounds of anything. When the friend entered the home that day, a television set were on, and lights and a television were on. The door to the house was ajar, according to police. So the house was just a little bit, the door was open. So they were probably let in, and then when they left, they just kind of casually shut it, but they, weren't, they didn't care if, they were gonna, if it actually went all the way. And then it said, uh, the police working in teams are showing recent photos of Polinsky to persons who may have seen her after she was last seen at 9 p.m. July 23rd. So on Saturday, around 9 o'clock, on July 23rd, she was seen somewhere. We don't get to know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. So this picture was just taken a week before she died right here. See, this one says the report also stated the victim was not sexually assaulted, but we know that's not true. Um, she kept to herself, uh, but she knew a lot of people. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, so there you go, Emily. You've got your assignment to go out and see if you can, you know, if they need some help here. But I definitely would be totally into paying for solving that you know it might be a little later in the year we could or we could slide that one in front of uh, a couple of these other ones I'm gonna you know try to make a pretty like almost pay for half of one of the DNA solves at the end of this month hopefully we'll see how it goes the rest of the month but doing okay currently so oh yeah yeah the Proverbial flood, right, Cindy? Oh, you don't have to cry. Jeez. Come on, Emily. We've been doing this. Let's do it. Let's do it. I mean, it'd be amazing. And you can even tell them that, uh, you know, it could just be to test the DNA to figure out who that woman is. I'm, I'm okay with it not being directly related to the homicide, right? It could just be the... Because uh, that right there might lead to an arrest in it. and Especially since they think that they are positive. There was a female that's not her at the scene when she was murdered. So they must the DNA must be in such a place or manner that lets them know that that was part of the murder scene where that DNA was collected. That's why touch DNA is lame, but... If you have touch DNA, that's a, uh, that's not, uh, you know, the victims that is in an area, like let's say you found touch DNA on a belt or something that was loose, like the pants, pants of a victim taken off or, you know, just, it just depends. But this one sounds like they're really pretty certain that there was an, a woman at the scene. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked at all if they're already working on that. But if they're not, Emily, then boom. And that little town is really small, so they probably could, they probably need something like that. 
All right. But the mere fact that we're talking about it, there's these, a couple of these other DNA people that, you know, they, they just, <laughs> never mind, it doesn't matter. Um, so hopefully we can help out, Emily. That'd be awesome. All right. Let me see how quickly I can zip. So the other one is James. I'm just not sure because this one might take. Let me show you what it looks like here. So there's this many articles in there. Like a ton. Just keeps going and going and going. So I'm not sure. We've run an hour and two minutes. But uh, let's see. 517. We go to 617. I could try. I can see where I get. Yeah, well, maybe we could. It's 1977. I don't know. This one seems like it's more sort of a local thing that somebody knew somebody. There just isn't enough people and nobody's willing to talk. That's why there's a woman at the scene. There aren't really. Yeah. Let's see. I mean, that's something that, you know. When I was sitting around, I was thinking, hmm, do we go look for it or something? I mean, so there's another scene. There's another one, Emily, where a female's at the scene. Mm -hmm. Right, so, well, that's the key, isn't it? Because there's a female that was at the scene. So if there isn't one like that, then it's, you know. I mean, we could try to look around if you guys want to in newspapers.com or something. But, you know, I was thinking about that earlier, but then I thought, like, there's just it's such a small little town. Where would that be? You know, <laughs> like in Holland or just anywhere in the state or something. You know, every, every case, people want to know if there's something similar to um, another one. Well, they have the DNA. They just haven't done genetic genealogy on it. Yeah, I mean, they know it's a female just because you can determine that in the DNA itself. Uh, but that was 2017. And maybe they, maybe they did uh, phenotyping. Who knows? What do you mean your what do you mean your question this account? Haven't you been on the channel for a long time? Yeah, I mean you can tell if somebody's a female with DNA, but you don't know who it is. <laughs> okay? That that's what the problem is right here. That's why we're saying we would pay for it. Let's see. Uh did you have any I don't know. They, well, all we have is what's in the article, so we don't know if, about a boyfriend they did question a friend. I'm assuming that might be somebody like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you do phenotyping, you can figure out, okay, uh, they had brown hair, their eye color looked like this, and those kind of things. But that, I think phenotyping is sort of useless at this point. It's something Parabon should just get rid of. It's it's almost dumb at this point. Okay, why not just go straight to genetic genealogy instead of going, well, this is what they look like, and that costs a lot of money too. It should just be part of the package. Like, okay, as you're working through the genetic genealogy, here's the phenotyping, and that's just what part of what we do here. This is what the person might look like, while you while we're doing the genetic genealogy here's a picture of what they might look like and if it resembles somebody that you've already kind of looked at maybe that'd be interesting but we'll tell you who the person is uh down the road here that's how it should be that it doesn't make any sense what you just said this account sorry 
This is 2017 was the last article. That was before anybody had ever done genetic genealogy um, in the current form. Hopefully we'll be like that across the nation one day. Yeah. God, you guys are just... <laughs> <laughs> oh. they haven't tried it this article was 2017 now maybe they are in the process of it or maybe the DNA wasn't good enough or something they could just tell it was a female I don't know uh, I guess we'll get the answer soon it almost if you get the the actual DNA there's always if it's a Caucasian person you can almost always find the answer it just takes you a lot longer if you start off with third cousins you know or fourth cousins or whatever I mean you know if you it all comes down to the center Morgans if you got like 80 center Morgans you're looking at like fourth fifth cousins and you know then it's a long process sometimes if you got 150 you're at like third 300 maybe second you know then you get the first cousins 800 you're right i mean i think 800 you're like for either first cousin or right next uh i'm not sure what 800 is there's actually a website that you go to that tells you what Center Morgan means in terms of how closely related they are. Well, they, she's murdered, so they, that's probably what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I don't know how they can tell somebody is sexually assaulted a hundred percent, you know, because um, you could have had sex with somebody, came home, and then somebody killed you, and you wouldn't know if they were sexually assaulted or not. So that's a that's a possibility, but usually that isn't the reality. Almost every time it's like that, and she's nude in her house, so she's nude sexually assaulted and killed while nude so the odds of it not being related are really low unless you say she was at a party she had sex with somebody she came home removed her clothes was taking a shower dried off from the shower then somebody came in and attacked her and they thought well she just had sex re recently and then you know that kind of thing whoa what's going on bama forever How you feeling, Bama Sorry, Forever? I'm late. Been very busy today. Well, you're not really late. I'm just really early. I mean, you know, isn't that the reality? Still alive, man. That, that thing's really been a struggle for you. I don't know if they have other DNA. But if they're sexually assaulted, you think they would have sperm. Except that it was 1977. Did they store that kind of stuff back then? Or did they just miraculously store a bunch of other evidence and now have been able to determine that... Um, one of the articles even said they collected evidence from the scene. So, don't know. Don't know. And look at that, we hit the goal anyways. <laughs> you guys are crazy. Oh, jeez, there goes that light again. Come on. Jeez. Turn this thing off. Maybe her landlord killed her. Yeah, maybe aliens too, Rainbow's in Kitty. You ever thought of that? Sorry if I missed it in the first articles, but that one said she was not in... Yeah, well, she was sexually assaulted. 
The first one says that she was. The last one says she was. There was one in the middle that says she wasn't. Uh, that's you, you don't believe that one. The newer ones are in the 2017. No way, Jessica. I guess I could do that. I mean, you know, why not? Relax and but you know what that would be? That would be 365 shots of liquor a year. Is that uh, something you guys really want me to be doing? And that and I do two shows now sometimes with these trial. So if I meet the goal on that one, I mean, 700 shots of that would be how many? What would that be? Like 45 fifths of. <laughs> <laughs> whatever whatever that is forget it yeah that was your next guess okay yeah so we were looking at it earlier there you if you go down the street view you can this is where the house was and then but it's not anymore but if you go over to the street view of it from uh, it's kind of cool on on Google's maps they have historical street view where Google Earth doesn't so if you turn around you look over in this direction but then you see the sea more and then you pick one like 2007 that's the house that was there at the time so somebody obviously was like yeah we're gonna tear this down now that's sort of weird. What is that? Is that a hose or hope that's not crime scene tape? But I mean, this is 40 years later, this shot right here, or 35 actually. Hey, did you guys happen to see the end of the um, Miami Heat game yesterday? <laughs> I mean, how awful do people feel for Miami today? God. Miami, the Miami Heater with the eighth seed barely made the playoffs. They beat everybody. They're up 3-0. They beat Boston twice in Boston. Then the third game, they won in Miami. Then the fourth game, they lost at home just barely. Then, then they go back to Boston. Then Boston wins again. Then Boston goes back to Miami for game number six. And Miami has a one-point lead with three seconds to go. Um... Miami or Boston shoots the ball from three really quickly. They miss it, and then they have a player that jumps up in the air and just taps the ball with point one on the clock, and it goes in. <laughs> I mean, what a nightmare! <laughs> what an absolute nightmare! At home, they lose. They would have made it to the World Championship Series, and now they have to go back to Boston for Game Seven. And man. Uh, and it'll be the first time in NBA history that a team came back from 3-0 like that. Yeah, but this, that's the perfect way, uh, time to do it, though, when you're uh, the home team and just blew it at the beginning of the series. But, oh, man, unbelievable. I, I mean, I, I felt bad for him, even though I don't really care that much. It's just, oh, God, the, that was crazy. No, it's one and a half stories. I don't. We don't know what floor their room is on. Doesn't say it in the article. Whatever was in the articles is what we got, right? Now yeah, they said they usually enter from the back. That was in the articles too. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch stories then. Let me see if I can zip through this other one. Uh, so this is these two nine-year-old boys went missing in 1964 here. And so we're switching topics, so let's move on to this one now, not keep going on the other one. We've already, we've already got all the information that we have available out on that one. And now Emily's going to go ask... The detectives, and then she can give us some other information. All right, cool, excellent. All right, all right, all right. But Gray, one more thing. What about the time when the guy went to the? Uh, 
Okay. Hmm. Shoot. All right, here we go. Uh, Nine-year-old boys missing from Fairfax home. This is in Cincinnati. Good night, Elaine. Don't see where I put this. Okay. All right. So both these kids live right here, and uh, let me get to the article. So two nine-year-old boys in suburban Fairfax have been missing since Thursday afternoon. It was reported late last night. Fairfax Police Chief James Finnan said he was unable to confirm any reports of Johnny Hudley and James McQuarrie school chums being <laughs> seen since 4 p.m. Thursday. Less than two months ago, Finnan was confronted with a missing child report that became one of the city's most gripping slaying cases. At that time, police. Uh, at that time, police and volunteers searching for two and a half days for four-year-old Debbie Dappen before her body was found under the porch of a neighbor boy. Uh, I mean, isn't that where these same kind of stories you hear about now, but they were always going on. And this is 1964. Who admitted he killed the little girl? A neighbor did and, and hit her underneath the porch. Finnan said that Hudley and McQuarrie boys are in the third grade at Fairfax School and were last seen playing together near their homes Thursday. Both were in class Thursday. Johnny is the son of Mrs. Gladys Hudley and James, uh, let's see, and James, the son of Mr. and Mrs. James McQuarrie. Finnan said he and others searched areas yesterday where the boys might have been wandered might have wandered, but uh, with no results. Relatives said neither boy had been known to run away from home or of wandering to the Little Miami River, which winds about a half mile from Fairfax. Johnny's relatives said he was a timid child and had always been punctual before. This is back in October of uh, 19... 64. October 15th is the day they went missing. Fairfax police press hunt for missing nine-year-olds. Suburban Fairfax police today pressed their search for two nine-year-old boys missing from their home since sometime Thursday. Missing are Johnny Hudley, son of Mr. Gladys Hudley, and James McQuarrie, son of James and Matilda McQuarrie, both of Fairfax. Cincinnati 6th District Police have also joined the intensive search for the youths nearby Lunkin Airport where the boys were reportedly seen has been given a thorough going over. Fairfax, a bedroom community of some 2,000 persons, was the scene of last August's disappearance of four-year-old Debbie Happen. Yeah, we went over that. Uh, reports from all areas about the two boys have uh, boys being seen or being checked. One report that they are attending the World's Fair in New York City has already gone out over the teletypes. Mrs. Bunny Gibbs, 21, sister of Hudley uh, Boy, said the family was unable to understand the disappearance. He had no reason to run away, he said. He was a quiet, shy boy. Hudley has another sister, age 3, and brother, age 14. The McQuarrie youth has three sisters and a brother. Mrs. Gibbs said the two boys, although friends for a long time, were the opposite in personality. She said the Macquarie youth was more outgoing. So you kind of wonder if one of the kids, his, that was the flaw that led to both of them, something happened to both of them. So I guess this is the one that was a little bit more outgoing on the left there. Okay, this is on the 19th. 
Two third grade boys who were last seen at 4 p.m. Thursday were still missing today. Suburban Fairfax Police said they will go on checking all leads. We have received phone calls from all over the greater Cincinnati area. Police Chief James Finnan said that after... You know what I should do is be have the old sound. Like I could go back to, like, let's see. He said that... The, does that work? Well, let's see. Oops. <laughs> The two third graders who had last seen... I could sound like an old radio or something. I don't think that's the one I was looking for, though. The chief said he had put out an alert to law enforcement officers in the eastern United States to be on the lookout for Johnny Hudley and Jimmy McQuarrie, both nine. There have been reports the Hudley boy told other children he planned to run away from home. The phone calls Finnan referred to were reports from uh, people who thought they saw youngsters. He said they, there have been dozens of them, both the boys, parents, and, and the police. We've checked out all the reports, the Fairfax Police, Cincinnati Police, County Police. He said all, always when we got there, the boys were gone. Uh, as the search continued, Fairfax residents recalled a similar incident in August when four-year-old Debbie had Dappen. So we already heard about that. All right, now we're on to October 20th. Police will uncover trench. Now, I'm not sure what the hell that is, but... A recently filled sewer trench... Oh, I see. ...will be re-excavated today in search of two missing boys. A load of gravel was dumped into the trench by construction workers sometime after 4 p.m. last Thursday, the day Johnny Hudley of 3850 Germania Avenue and James McQuarrie of 6013 Wooster Park were seen for the last time. And this, these are their homes right here. This is where Hudley lived. And that looks like that's been there. I mean, that's an old house right there. So there's that one, and then his buddy lived here. I don't know what was here at the time or what it looked like. There might have been a house here, and then eventually turned into a business. Uh, I mean, hell, that could be that could be the house right there, I guess. But I mean, this is a different road. Perhaps at one time, this was the front of that house, but then later they moved it. So it's possible that. They might have put a back road in here, then leads to that house. So that very well could be the house right back there. There's just no street view on Mary Street right there. There's another, looks like another one even right there. Chief Finnan said he would ask construction workers to open up the 20-foot deep hole which had been dug on Eleanor Street parallel. Oh, let's see what that looks like. Let's see where Eleanor Street is in here. All right there. And so it was dug parallel. Let's see if I type in 6,000. That's right there. So it was um, been dug up on Eleanor Street parallel to 6,000 of the Wooster Pike. I don't know where Wooster Pike, Pike is. Oh, that one? So maybe this was Wooster Pike at one point. I don't know. They, I mean, they must have changed it, but this is where it is right here. Eleanor Street. And it's right next to where they are. So they thought maybe their bodies were accidentally buried in there. On the 22nd, here's another picture of them there. Saw two missing boys Friday, says local train inspector. <laughs> Sounds just like that other case. The guy working at the park, remember? A Cincinnati train inspector declared Wednesday night 
He was positive he saw at least one of the boys missing, nine-year-old Fairfax boys in uh, Bond Hill B&O Railroad Yard Friday. The report by John Clark, Sr. of 424 Strafford Street East and spurred hopes that uh, Johnny Hudley and James McQuarrie will be found alive. Mr. Clark, 57, inspector for the B&O, said he was certain he saw young McQuarrie at 9.45 a.m. Friday at the Bond Hill Yard. I wonder if it's still called that. Bond Hill Yard? How about train? Uh, we'll just go to there. How far away is that? That's way over here. Eh. So, I don't know. That's kind of far away. <clears throat> well, I mean, I'll tell you how far it is. Miles wise, it's. Yeah. Five and a half, probably. He said police in St. Louis have been alerted since the freight cars were bound for there. The two have been missing since last Thursday. I always go to Bond Hill Yard in the morning because we have an interchange there, Mr. Clark said, and it was 9.45 a.m. that I saw those two kids who had been playing in the freight cars. Hmm. The one who did the talking, so he actually talked to one of these. The one who did the talking after I approached them was McQuarrie, the McQuarrie boy. He was wearing a striped shirt and had the freckles and turned up nose of the missing boy. The other boy sort of hid away in the background. And that's how they described McQuarrie was outgoing. The other one was quiet. Huh. Well, I mean, you know, I guess five miles isn't horrendously far. Uh, my brothers, my brother and his friends used to hang out at the railroad yards. <laughs> I mean, it was weird. This boy asked about where the cars were going, and I told him St. Louis, where I asked him where he lived. He told me it was none of my business. Mr. Clark said he was unable to contact Chief Finnan Saturday after getting a number from Cincinnati Police Station X. There was no answer at the number. Then I forgot about it Sunday. Oh, really? You forgot about it? Right. I figured the boy... The boys could have gone to sleep in a fair, uh, freight car around Fairfax and ridden it to the yard next morning, Mr. Clark said. Textbooks the boys used at Fairfax School have been sent to the FBI Identification Bureau in Washington for fingerprint checks. These would be matched with those on any bodies turned up in the search. Johnny is the son of Mrs. Gladys Hudley of Germania address. James lived with his parents, James and Matilda McQuarrie. <laughs> okay. Missing boys alert issued nationwide. Nine-year-old pair believe last seen in railroad yard. There's a chance this is already, let's see. It is my feeling that if those boys who have now been missing for a week are picked up at all, they will be picked up by some policeman who sees them outside too late or at a time they should be in school. I mean, these kids are nine years old, for God's sake. How come they weren't more like these kids have been abducted? Uh, there is a chance this has already happened. Chief Finnan said he felt the nine-year-old boys who were last seen at 4 p.m. last Thursday or the possibility... I mean, I think nowadays they would almost immediately go to abduction. But back then, there, it just seemed like there was sort of more of a naive uh, thoughts about what's going on. When the man saw them at the Bond Railroad Yard Friday, asked them who they were, they wouldn't tell him. That almost sounds like a pretty legitimate uh, sighting. I mean, was he wearing a striped shirt? Clark, who received a Carnegie Medal for rescuing a child from drowning in 1961, told Finnan he was positive one of the boys was James McQuarrie. Wearing striped shirt. He was wearing a striped shirt. 
and had those freckles and turned up nose of the missing boy, Clark said. The boy, the other boy sort of hid. This boy asked about where the cars were going, and I told him St. Louis. When I asked him where he lived, he told me it was none of my business. So that's kind of some similar information. I'm trying to plow through these, <laughs> kind of skipping. I don't want to read every word. Missing boy's mother still hoping for word. It was my imagination running away with me. The distraught 39-year-old mother offers dark circles. Wait, right here it says, Gladys Huntley awoke last night thinking she heard her 9-year-old son calling her. He wasn't. It was her imagination running away with me. The distraught 39-year-old mother offers dark circles, rim, her blue eyes, they mirror the nightmare she's living. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Banna Forever. A reading fee. That's right. As soon as the reading starts, it just... Uh, uh, well, we got up to 150 people. It's not too bad, I guess. At 8.30... Let's see. Mrs. Hudley's nightmare began on October 15th. It was a warm autumn afternoon. The sort that makes you pick up a purse, meet a friend, and go window shopping. Yeah, I've never had that thought. It's weird. She did just that. At 8.30 that evening... A call came to her friend's home. Johnny had failed to come home for dinner. Miss Hudley's daughter, Bonnie, told her. In fact, Johnny still wasn't home. Mrs. Hudley, a widow, was disturbed. Uh, Johnny always called if he, if, it was, if he was late. Besides, it was now chilly. All Johnny wore was gym shoes, black pants, and a t-shirt. Twenty-four hours passed and still no word. By this time, a missing person bulletin had been radioed across the nation. Newspapers, radio, and television had brought the disappearance to the public's eye. The Hudley telephone was alive with false but well-meaning reports as to the youth's whereabouts. Uh, I don't think any harm has come to him. Oh, is this a site? Now, nearly two weeks later, Johnny and his friends are still missing. Like any other woman, Miss Hudley refuses to believe the worst. I don't think any harm has come to him, she says. I think he's ran away. Why, I don't, why, I don't know. Maybe he hopped a freight car. Uh, could he... Uh, could be he's where there's no official to catch him. Besides Johnny and 21-year-old Bonnie, Mrs. Hudley had a son, Bobby, 14, and daughter, Connie, 3, her husband died of a heart attack two years ago. Until last May, Miss Hudley was employed here as a waitress. She quit her job to spend more time with her youngsters. Uh, she now draws Social Security. Telephone calls to the Hudley home have ebbed. Those that do come in, however, ring, but uh, once until answered, I guess. Uh, let's see. Johnny may call any time, Miss Hudley hopes. The Hudleys live in a two-story frame house here, upstairs in Johnny's bedroom in a, a rude, uh, let's see, orange construction paper reminded, reminder he pasted to, together reads, think before temptation as good as always near. Johnny must not have paid much attention to it, his mother says, shaking her head. Yeah, I shake my head quite a bit in here. That's one of my favorite uh, SMH, you know, just... Sometimes I think my head's just going to fall off. It shakes so much. Missing Boys... Now, Missing Boys Parents Quiz, you know, the families of two missing suburban Fairfax, Fairfax boys have been undergone lie detector tests in connection. I mean, that sounds kind of foolish, you know, like two different families, really. Hey, D and K Rack, the the king of putting in crazy random numbers. Hey, freaks, let's celebrate being part of the best YouTube family ever created. <laughs> oh. 
Yeah, that's what I think, but... Gray not only uh, cares about us, all of us, he cares hey, for friends, justice. Well, there you go. Let's celebrate being part of the best YouTube family ever created. Gray not only cares about all of us, he cares for justice. Well, I think you guys care about me, too. So what do you think about that? You guys always make me feel like you're uh, concerned, you know, when I'm stressed out and shit or whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, the two nine-year-old Jimmy Hudley, son of Mrs. Gladys Hudley, and James McQuarrie, son of James. Uh, the boys had been in a minor trouble in the community for the past year, Finn said. Neither did well in Fairfax Elementary School. In the days before their disappearance, they twice skipped out of a... Hmm, so they were kind of like troublemaker kids, you know, of a local drive-in restaurant without paying their check. On the day before they were last seen, they went back to the restaurant and paid the two checks with a $20 bill, Finn said. They claimed they found it on the street. Oh, so they felt guilty or what? Fairfax is the same community where Debbie Dappen Ford disappeared August 13th. So they're little, you know, they're not quite like, you know, squeaky clean little kids, right? Although that's not really incredibly unusual for kids that age to do something like that. Return hope for youth's abandon. Hope's the too long missing nine year old from suburban, now nah, I think we're in uh, November now, like a month, it's five weeks later. Police Chief James Finnan said Monday night, the boys who reported reportedly spent a night at a service station near Lilly, Kentucky were not Johnny Hudley and James McQuarrie. The two boys were last seen October 15th. The chief said he had a talk with the boys who visited the service station and identified them as Walter Lee Pauley, 15, and David Ward, 13, of nearby Loveland. He said the boys hitchhiked to a relative's home in Virginia. Yeah, that's so stupid. Man, that age hitchhiking. Elmer Howes, a truck driver from suburban Amelia passed through the service station the night after the boys had hitched a ride on a car going north to towards London, Kentucky. He told, wait, what? What is that? Yeah. We're not Johnny Hudley and Jim. Okay, there were just two other boys, so it doesn't. The rest doesn't matter. Okay, and then we've got not suspected in Fairfax. A 15-year-old boy arrested Monday night was dis was discounted by Fairfax Chief James Finnan as a possible suspect in the disappearance of two Fairfax boys. District 6 police who picked up the boys, the boy on a theft charge said he has a record of molesting small boys, then invited Fairfax police to question him. However, a patrolman uh, Robert Bullman said after questioning the boy that he was satisfied the young, the youth knew nothing of John Hudley. Wow, that's crazy that they're monitoring a 15-year-old child molester. Okay, boy's not in trench. So they checked that whole thing, the sewage pipe or whatever they were putting in, and they were not in there. So they're just gone at this point. So now we're three years later. Slew Fairfax Lee's local Marine says. Let's see. Uh, the three-year-old mystery of the disappearance of two Fairfax boys appeared solved late Thursday with the confession of a Fairfax Marine in San Diego, California. Police here are now searching for the bodies of John Hudley, 9, son of Miss Gladys Hudley, uh, 3850, Germania. San Diego police said Private Gary Lee McKee, 17, who lives at 3758 
Mito Lane Fairfax confessed to the killings to a San Diego minister at the Ocean Beach Church. Reverend William T. Latz then called, hey, good for that guy, you know? He didn't keep it. <laughs> Police said McKee, who's been in the service since August, was absent without leave from his, from his base. Yeah, so let me, let me just, so that was the 15th of September, 1967. Marine claims he did that, right? Tests show Marine story is a hoax. So there you go. Attorneys at Fairfax Police Chief James Finnan said that a lie detector, and I'm glad too because since this is Memorial Day, I was hoping, <laughs> I didn't realize that we were, you know. Uh, anyways, he didn't have anything to do with it. So it says, at attorney at Fairfax Police Chief James Finnan said that, or it's tomorrow is Memorial Day, but you know. A lie detector test has shown Marine Private Gary Lee McKee, 17, was telling the truth when he said he did not kill two nine-year-old boys who have been missing for three years. The boy, John Hudley and James McQuarrie, and McKee lived in suburban Fairfax. McKee, listed by Marines as absent without leave, told a minister in San Diego, California, that he killed the boys and buried their bodies. After being brought back here, he repudiated the statement. He had named a 16-year-old boy now living in Indianapolis as his accomplice, but Finnan said a lie detector test taken earlier this week by that youth showed he had no connection with the case. At the conclusion of the test, McKee was picked up by two Marines uh, for return to San Diego on AWOL charges. So he basically, he was trying to get out of the military um, and thought it was a great idea to confess to a murder. I mean, I mean that's really, you got to be really committed to get out. So this is 1972, which is eight years later. And it says, James A. McQuarrie, the Fairfax boy who disappeared with a young friend eight years ago, has been declared legally dead by Hamilton County probate judge Chase M. Davies. Mrs. Mrs. James McQuarrie of 1566 Hill Street Lane, uh, she, doesn't, she moved, although she had told reporters she firmly believes her son is alive somewhere, the legal formality, she explained, will let her collect a thousand dollar life insurance policy which will then be put into trust for Jimmy. Nine-year-old Jimmy, who then lived with the, his family at 6103 Wooster uh, Parkway, I think, was last seen about 4 p.m. October 15, 1964, with his friend Johnny Hudley, 9, of 3850 Germania Avenue, also still missing. A police search of nearby Little Miami River construction areas and railroad boxcars, which had been in the area, failed to turn up any clues. I think they were abducted by a child predator. I think it's just so... Um, you know, that's, that's the only thing that really kind of makes any sense. You know, and I, and I bet you that McQuarrie was like, hey, dude, hey, let's get a ride with these guys. You know, he kind of convinced the Shire one to go do something outside of the shy one's bounds. Not that that's bad. I mean, often you have friends like that, but it led to them doing something and trusting somebody that they shouldn't have. That's weird how there's just so little information, though. And six years after that, 1978, Vane Hunt for Fairfax Boys recalled. So this is sort of a retrospective, I guess. Let's see. The disappearance of five-year-old Keith Holiday brings back memories of another extensive search 13 years ago for two Fairfax Boys. John Hudley and James McQuarrie were nine years old when they disappeared. No one has heard from them since. The boys were last seen October 15th at... Frisch's Mainliner Restaurant on Wooster Pike. Keith Holliday was last seen December 21st by his mother. Uh, let me see. Department did little... Uh, let's see. I'm going to skip the other story, though. Former Fairfax Police Chief James Finnan says there was a time when he took calls regularly from persons who thought they had seen Johnny and Jimmy. 
It seemed for a while that any time anyone saw a couple of kids, they'd tie them to the missing boy. The missing boys. Finn and recall. Finn and recall. People would say they'd just passed a car going in the opposite direction of their car and that it looked like the boys were in it. We got lots of impossible leads like that, but we tried to follow up on all of them. Finnan says his department did little else for months. It was exhausting, he continued. We sent flyers with their picture to 500 cities across the country. We even contracted a psychic in Europe. Great. The search was expensive to Finnan. Expensive to Finnan. Doesn't remember the exact figures, but he said it cost the village a sizable sum to unearth the village sewer system that was under construction at the time of their disappearance. School books taken from the deaths of the missing boys were sent to the FBI in hopes police could obtain fingerprints of each to aid in the search. Authorities of the Container Corp of American asked their offices in Memphis to search boxcars for the boys. They thought the boys could have climbed aboard since they lived so close to the Container Corporation. You know, wouldn't it be suck if it was a story like they did get into a container? And given the, uh, you know, we don't, what time of year was it? So it was October. They got stuck in one of those. Maybe they went, it was a place where it was sunny. And they died in one of the containers. And then the owners of the boxcars didn't want that to be out there. So, you know, you know, just never going to get to know the answer to a question like that. Usually they wouldn't do something like that. Uh, right up. That's that theory is right up there with the aliens. So, the parents of one of the missing boys took lie detector tests. Yeah, uh, parents of the two, Mrs. Gladys Hudley and Mrs. James McQuarrie, could not explain why the boys disappeared. It seems as though the earth opened up. How many times have we heard this one? Seems like the earth opened up and swallowed them. Miss McQuarrie said, "I want to hope that they will come home alive." I don't want to think anyone out, think uh, anything else. To spur the search, the Fairfax team canteen offered a hundred dollar reward for information leading to the boys' whereabouts. For a while, there was hope. Two boys meeting a similar description spent a night in a gas station in Lily, Kentucky, near London. They told two attendants and the owner of the station that. They were, the Fair, they were from Fairfax and had left home. Mrs. Hudley drove to the small town to get more information on the boys. She learned that they were hitchhiking and said she was encouraged after talking to persons in the area. Her hopes were shattered that evening when two Loveland boys, ages 13 and 15, returned home and admitted to the hoax. Oh, you guys, it was a hoax? Jeez, I thought it was just... Uh, let's see. Her hopes were shattered that evening. Okay, except for, except for friends, relatives, and members of Fairfax Police Department, the search for Johnny and Jimmy was virtually forgotten for three years. Then, in the fall of 1967, a Lutheran minister from San Diego, California, announced that a 17-year-old Marine had confessed to killing the boys. Gary Lee McKee was brought back to his hometown of Fairfax for questioning. But after hours... After an hour's search of wooded area off Red Bank Road, where McKee said he buried the bodies, the young Marine repudiated his confession. Several days later, McKee passed a lie detector test, which police said exonerated him. His attorney said he fabricated the false confession to get back to Cincinnati because the Marine regimen uh, was too much for him to accept emotionally. We never did find evidence linking McKee with those boys, Finnan said, and as the years went by, no new evidence was found either. The retired chief, who is 73 now, speculates these boys were old enough at the time of their disappearance to know who they were and where they live. If they were ever in a position they could have talked to somebody and found their way back home, they probably met with a fatal mishap. In 1972, Mrs. McQuarrie said that until someone can convince her otherwise, she will continue to believe her son is alive. And yet, 
She asks probate court to declare him legally dead. Should Johnny and Jimmy return to Fairfax, they'll find their families no longer live there. Chief Finnan says she doesn't know where they move, attempts to, or he doesn't know where they move. They attempts to find the family members have been unsuccessful. All right, then 2017. Uh, let's see. It's weird how there's these like 2017 all the time for some of these. Uh, it's not just like this one. I noticed that. Um, were, were Johnny Hudley and Jimmy McQuarrie killed by the neighborhood teen who confessed to stabbing them only to retract that confession later? Were the nine-year-old best friends killed by a man who buried their bodies under a porch in Massachusetts, as his daughter claimed? Were they kidnapped by someone driving a black Cadillac near the Frisch on Wooster Pike, as one witness reported? They Did they die accidentally, perhaps falling into one of the many construction digs in the East Side Village 53 years ago? The disappearance of the Fairfax School third graders in 1964 is the oldest cold case in Tri-Staters memory and one of the most baffling Fairfax police detective Mike Murphy, who has worked on the case over several decades, says there have been 50 to 60 different rumors. Hundreds of officers and volunteers, young and old, search the village, combing through the high grass and brush along the Little Miami River, and digging up freshly filled construction sites, the search went nationwide. Railroad workers looking through freight cars in case the boys had decided to go on an adventure. The investigation took Fairfax officers to California, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Kentucky. Murphy, who started investigating the case in the 1970s, has the history, so does Johnny Hudley's sister. Murphy, who started investigating the case in the 1970s, has the, his history. That's eh, not too long. Let's see. Bonnie Hudley Zorn still aches to know what happened to her little brother and his best friend. I put it on Facebook every year, she said. It's terrible, just absolutely terrible. We're all getting old. We got to know something. If he's dead, then we want to know that. We want closure. Bonnie recalled the last time she saw John. It all ended when he walked up the street. He, uh, he had on a white t-shirt and blue jeans and white gym shoes. He had just gotten home from school. It was 3.30 in the afternoon, she said. Bonnie was 20 at the time, the oldest of four kids. Their father had died a year earlier and their mother had gone back to work. Bonnie, 11 years older than John, was like a surrogate mom. Yeah, like that, yeah, because she'd be 20. I can take you back to the very night, she said, wiping away tears as she remembered back to Thursday, October 15th, 1964. So she's pretty old. She's like 70 ish you know like i mean it's weird when you read these things because at the time they're so young but now she's 70. he was not the type of child or 69 probably he was not the type of child that didn't come home on time he was always there when he was supposed to be well i had fixed supper that night at six o'clock he wasn't home but he came home from school earlier and got some coke bottles he got the coke bottles and he went up to the store, up the street, to cash the pop bottles in. And that's the last time I ever saw him. See, I think this is a child abduction murder. I called my mom at work and told her, and she said, well, call around and see if you can find him. So I called some of his friends and, you know, hollered for him outside, no answer. Mom came home from work and she called the police. And the police came and said, He's just run away. But Bonnie said her brother wouldn't have done that. There's no reason. There was no argument. Nobody was fighting. Nobody was mad at him. Nothing, she said. 
He just walked up the street with the with the pop bottles. I watched him walk up there. That was the last I seen him. Witnesses reported seeing the two boys walking along Wooster Pike near Frisch and paying a bill there. They made sen- that made sense to Bonnie. They were always together. They were inseparable. They were best buddies, she said. But then the boys vanished together and the mystery began. Hey, thanks, Plato. Not Play Doh, but Plato. Okay. Make sure we get that right. Murphy was only 14 at the time and didn't join Fairfax Police until nine years later. But he said he quickly started working the case and reading the original investigators' reports. We had a lot of construction going on back in 64, especially across the pike, Murphy said. The first theory was that they fell down a manhole, were playing around some digging areas, and got covered up by all the dirt. series of unfortunate events. I'm bummed to have to be on replay crew. Enjoy the show, freaks. Yep. Well, thank you, Plato. Let's see. Workers dug up several work sites in vain, in a vain search, Murphy said. They actually dug up some of the piping that they put in across the street on Spring Street, thinking that they fell down a hole and got covered up with dirt. They dug it up and down here on the west side of Fairfax, Swallen's warehouse was going in, so there was a lot of mounds of hills. You know how kids are. They like to climb these hills. Murphy said John and Jimmy were outdoors uh, outdoors kids. These kids were out after school, and they kind of run the streets of Fairfax, Murphy said. They were fun-loving, not out causing any trouble. It was kind of a little different than the kids today. Murphy didn't put much faith in a report about a Cadillac driver abducting the boys. I don't know, man. I'd put more faith in something like that. I think it's unlikely that these two kids would let somebody grab them. I don't know. It sounds like one of the kids was sort of more gregarious. And I think they were lured, suckered into a car. That investigation didn't go far, he said, because there wasn't much information to go on. Murphy said he left Fairfax Police in 1984 and went to the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation. In 2010, he returned to Fairfax and the missing boys case. In 2010, we had some information that was given to the police department. One of them was that they were abducted and buried in an area that we that kind of looked at, that we kind of looked at. It turned out to be false. One of the strangest tips led Murphy to New England. A lady from Foxborough, Massachusetts, had mailed Fairfax saying that her father did it. I started communicating with her. We decided that we had to follow this to the end, Murphy said. The old chief there, Rick Patterson, said, you take it and go with it. So at that point, I thought we need to get DNA from these kids. Murphy said he went to several family members and got samples. Huh. The lady from said he mailed for saying her father did it. Well, why, why, what about the DNA? Why do you need DNA? I sent it off to my lab, BCI, Murphy said, of course. I was retired from BCI at the time, but I still had a connection up there. I sent it off to the National Combined, you know, CODIS, I guess. So there's anything that comes up, identifiable bones that have been found anywhere in the United States, they notify us, and it all goes to BCI. Murphy said he and the chief... Then drove to Foxborough and talked to the women, and then he went to New Hampshire to interview her mother and siblings. The woman had some psychological problems, Murphy said. I even interviewed her therapist. She uh, thought she was telling the truth. Her statement was that her father abducted these kids and killed them in the basement and then buried them underneath the porch in Foxborough. Just in case, Murphy said, he arranged to get a cadaver dog from Foxborough. Police and searched the house. They found nothing. Then he went down to Kentucky, where the woman's father lived. He was originally from Middletown. 
After that, Murphy decided there was nothing to the woman's claims. Three years after the boys dis disappeared, it appeared that the case had been solved. A 17-year-old Marine private named Gary Lee McKee said he had killed them. McKee, who grew up in Fairfax and was living there when the boys went missing, confessed to a minister. McKee promised to show Fairfax police where he buried the bodies, and Bonnie remembers that her mom went along. They went from one place to another, from one place to another, and my mother was right. It was right there, she said. McKee took them for a ride, Bonnie said. No, it was, it was over here. No, it was over here. And finally he said, no, I, I lied about it. I just told that to get out of the service. And my mother was just absolutely devastated. We interviewed him, I couldn't tell you how many times, and polygraphed him, Murphy said. You know, that was the Vietnam War, so he probably going to Vietnam, and I don't think he wanted to take that venture. It worked for McKee. At that point, the Marine Corps said, we don't want, uh, we don't want any more to do with you. To be sure, police dug up McKee's backyard where he said he buried the weapon and found nothing, according to reports. They didn't dig up the areas where he said he buried the boys. Um, they had been developed. John and Jimmy would be in their 60s if they were alive, so what happened to them? Murphy's best guess is that they died accidentally the day they went missing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think that's a good guess. I think they just all, I think they just, all the construction that was going on in Fairfax back then, they may have gone in a hole and was buried up with dirt that fell in behind them and didn't make it out. And we didn't dig the right areas. John's sister doesn't think they died by accident. I don't either. I don't believe he ever left Fairfax. I believe he, he's buried down there where the old schoolhouse used to be in them woods that were down there, she said. She said she wishes police could give McKee another polygraph test using updated technology. Both agree time is running out. I just hope and pray that before the rest of us leave here that we find something. Murphy said he would love to solve this thing for families, but the case gets cold. Memories are lost and people die. All the investigators that initially worked this case back in 64, they're all deceased, Murphy said. We get calls from time to time we just really don't have any good concrete leads. Hopefully one day, who knows, remains may be found. If you have any information about this case, call Fairfax Police at 513-271-7250. And there they are again. I think they were abducted by a child predator. Doesn't that sound, doesn't that just sort of make more sense given what we know now? I mean, there's, there's hardly any information in the case, but I mean, you know, you got the side info and different things that happen. You know, so, I mean, they put these pictures in, this is what they would look like. Nobody left for, like, that kind of reason. All the links are in the description, but anyways, you guys, I think that's going to do it. And you guys are absolutely incredible. You got to the goal anyways. And I thought that was going to take a lot longer to go through those articles, but, you know, some of them you didn't really need to read, especially the ones that say, police say there's no new updates. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, you don't need to go through that one. But anyways, I'm going to go hang out with the stepkids. That's why I did a four-hour show earlier, or two hours now, so that we could, you know, hang out do something together but uh, if you're out there scout dude maybe you could send me a link to uh, something associated with Memorial Day or we can just do more to the wounded warrior what do you think about what's that other one that's out there too it's called um, I don't know like tunnels to towers but that's more for like a whole bunch of different types I think it's more like rescuers right oh you did okay cool all right we'll take a look at that uh, a little bit later Oh, there it is. 
Yeah. Okay. You got it. Oh, God. Another five emails from somebody. I'm trying to get the, the, I liked having that last scene that we put up on the screen, the credits, it's better. Roll the credits, all right. Might have to start over again. Um. Danielle, are these right? Is this is this from earlier today or is this one? I think it's this one. Danielle, Travelin, Teresa, Dobby, Smith, Kathy, Japen, Emily, Flotilla, Chara, Doobie, Jessica, Schubach, Annie, T, Linda, Howe, as in Linda Molden, Howe, the Cattle Mutilations, Love in the Sun, Bama, Forever, D and K, Rec, Plato. New members are Tara, Brent, Tindall. Madrox Boogie, Sniper79, YouTube, Callie Emmon, Gene Darcy. Um, anyways, we're gonna do we'll do a spin too. So hold on. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. You guys are you know and thank you again to Bama Forever who was I think combined was almost half of that. So I really appreciate that. Let me uh, get this right here. That was a special thanks there. And but all of you guys are it's so you know you guys are so generous to you know, every single day you keep helping out. And that's what allows me to keep going and then we do so such amazing things too. So last I mean the last two months I think we've done four thousand to charity in a row, which is you know, historically that would have been pretty good that we had boosted it up but I worked really hard this month so I'm hoping to be able to do like 6,000 which would be pretty sweet you know. maybe more who the hell knows right but uh, let's go and hopefully I got everybody in here if I don't don't worry about it the goal of the show isn't to get into the spin, right? It's not like a... So here we go. And you're on there at Bama Forever, so likely it would land on yours. But maybe not. Look at that. Chara Doobie Doobie. There you go, Chara Doobie. You won the notebook. Hey, by the way, if you're if you want the blue notebook, they're pretty cool, right? You send in twenty five to PayPal, you get the stress ball, you get the blue notebook, right? And you get the um, there's a blue pen that comes with it. There, it's really cool, right? So you just send it in the PayPal and you get it. You put in there you want the notebook though, because some people send twenty five just because they're sending 25, but if you want the notebook, uh, make sure to put that in the message, right? So anyways, thank you guys very much, and uh, you know, tomorrow is Memorial Day, so make sure that you're, you know, really kind of thinking about what the, you know, our armed forces do for the rest of us. You know, I think a lot of us, some days we're just sort of take it for granted. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, hey, that's cool, you know. But, man, that's the reason we get to be like this. If they didn't exist, we wouldn't still be sitting here right now. And there's a lot of other countries out there, to be honest with you, that they're only there now because we exist. Okay, if we didn't enter World War II, there'd be a lot of people speaking German in uh, Europe at this point but we went over there and I think it was something like 
I don't know how what the numbers, but or at least over a hundred thousand people, soldiers died in World War Two over there, and uh, at least that I think it's more like a million. You know what? What's the number? I might be confusing one of them because I think it was like uh, let me let me type it in. Hold on a second. Oh yeah, so it was. Um, 318,000 people died. And I think the Civil War was something like 500,000 or, or more. I mean, it was crazy. But, uh, you know, so 300, but that's, that's an internal war. <laughs> but 318,000, the biggest one was, uh, well, it says Army and Air Force. Excuse me, it was Air, Army and Air Force was 318. Navy was 62. Marines was 24, so it's really probably closer to like 400,000 or something. Yeah. That's a ton of people that risked their lives to protect this country. And really, they're, you know, they went over there to stop Hitler and basically the whole, I think it was even Italy, Germany, and um, Japan who sort of jumped in strangely. I don't know what how they how uh like hitler would have dealt with japanese people they don't look like what he wanted people to look like right so we went over there and fought to protect them but really so that maybe they wouldn't be coming here later too i mean it's pretty crazy that we did that like france wouldn't be france right now oh that's not true gray we would be a uh, bullshit dude you, you you owe your existence to us so all of your arrogant bullshit attitude that you have a lot of times when your your leaders are talking to our country well just realize you wouldn't be there okay all right thank you very much everybody for watching really appreciate it <laughs> yeah hey right you got to admit what i just said is true everybody admit it yeah, anyways, we'll see you tomorrow. Um, you know, make sure to give some props. You see a soldier out there walking around at a restaurant, maybe buy their food for them. You know what I'm saying? All right, thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. And until next time, be safe out there. And a one, and a two, and a three, and a four. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a crime dissector, flag rejecter. I'm a certified human lie detector. I'm gonna, gonna get, get you, you wanna stretch you. you. If you try and play me like an old projector, crime sector is my nectar. Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture. Crime collector, freak connector, and I'm always gonna be He's a photo bombing. He's photo bombing her. Intercept. And I'm meaner than a spectre with a vector On his pector with all respect ya Just remember I've a temple for conjecture I have no agenda, I'm no pretender And I'll serve it to you straight without the blender And in the end, I'm gonna send ya On a mission to reveal the true offender yeah, so I'll just All get right, right everybody, Yay. Thank you, thank you very much Yep, yep, yep. And also, thank you guys again for getting uh, the goal and everything like that. I really appreciate it. All right? I thought I was going to have to save that story because it was like, okay, well, but there's a lot of articles in there. Move it to, to Tuesday or something, or no, Monday. Uh, but you know what? It wasn't really that long. We got done, and now it's uh, 6.31. All right. So thank you guys very much. See you tomorrow, and... Be safe out there. Do you guys still want to do... Wait, by the way, do you guys still want to do the Arius uh, midday? I mean, I can put it in there. I just got to keep going. We got to get... We got to... That thing is such a long trial. We got to get through that one. So I'm going to do it. All right, everybody. See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>